A long and difficult battle has come to a disappointing end for Sue Rodriguez. The woman from British Columbia has lost her court fight for the right to have a doctor help her kill herself. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled against her request for a doctor-assisted suicide. Four of the justices, including the Chief Justice, agreed with Rodriguez. Five of the nine justices ruled that an individual's right to a dignified death does not override the sanctity of life under the law. And therefore, Sue Rodriguez was denied the legal right to a doctor-assisted suicide. Many Canadians remember the Rodriguez case. And it's one of the big first news events I remember. There was so much coverage of that case uh, that even if you were just a kid paying attention to things, um, you knew about this issue. And I think a lot of Canadians knew about it from then. And, uh, and it's been sort of sitting with society for this long period of time. I was talking to Joe and we were just talking about physician-assisted dying, and I'm sure part of what I was going on about was how much I hate the Rodriguez decision. At the time, I thought it was the wrong decision. Reflecting back now, I understand the decision, but I always thought um, it was a case that needed to be relitigated one day. This is an issue that touches almost every family in Canada. Someone will have a friend or a loved one who becomes afflicted with a serious disease and has to grapple with these very difficult choices. I, um, I used to work for a different law firm called Arve Finley and that was just with Joe. Um, and, uh, and that's where we were when we started this case and that was couple years ago and I think it started because Joe was asked to give a talk. I wasn't sure what to talk about and I discussed my dilemma with my spouse Connie and she says why don't you talk about the Rodriguez case. Thank, thank you Lauren for those very kind remarks and it's uh, my distinct pleasure to be here today to speak to all of you. At the end of it, Grace Pastine, the um, general counsel for the Civil Rights Association, asked me um, if I would do the case if they were interested in taking it on, and I told them that I was, and that the rest is history. Shortly after we filed our lawsuit, we were contacted by Gloria Taylor. And she said, I read about your lawsuit. I'd like to be a part of this. Like Sue Rodriguez, she was a British Columbia woman who was afflicted with ALS. Just before Christmas in 2009, I was diagnosed with ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It was the most devastating day of my life. My body is weak and tired, and I'm in pain all the time. My arms are weak, and I can barely lift or reach up for things. I'm dying piece by piece, and I'm asking the mercy of the courts to allow me the right to die with dignity. It is cruel and inhumane to force me or any other Canadian to suffer a prolonged death. ALS, this amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is Lou Gehrig's disease where you, you lose control of your muscles. Uh, about 600 people a year die of ALS. About 3,000 people at any, any given time in Canada have ALS. I think to their shame, the assisted suicide advocates um, try to sensationalize the horror of dying from ALS. And you have people talking about uh, people drowning in their own secretions. And, and if, if I, I ask my palliative care colleagues about this, they, they tell me that that's um, terribly dishonest and misleading, that, uh, the, the, that just about all of those 600 people in Canada that die of that disease every year die a peaceful death. And in fact, the comment was made to me that, that an ALS death is among the most peaceful deaths that they ever attend. The 
the last stages of ALS are similar to what I experienced right after my accident when I was bedridden with tubes down my throat and into my lungs. There was a period of time where my lungs had almost completely collapsed and they were just suctioning phlegm out. First of all, you think you're gonna drown in the next uh, two minutes and that happens over and over and over again. You know, there's no pain medication that's gonna help. I think it's, it was well-intentioned torture. If my suffering was being afflicted upon me in any other context, it would be called an abuse of human rights and might well be called a crime. But because it happens in the name of modern medicine, I'm supposed to accept whatever indignities my illness inflicts upon me and keep quiet. What we really had there was someone who was finding their situation meaningless, was frightened by the loss of control, and was not focusing on hope for the future. The moment that she decided that she was gonna die was when she was being pushed in a wheelchair around her garden by her eight-year-old son, and uh, she, she said something like, slow down, or don't push so fast, or stop, and, and he playfully pushed her a little faster. I've had young mothers in my practice faced with, with uh, a serious terminal illness who struggled to live every day that they could just to have more time with their children. To see that Sue, uh, perhaps impaired by her disease or um, impaired by her depression, was not able to hold on to the joy of, of more time with her son. It would be patronizing for us to tell those people that they should just adapt and cope with their disability. And, and I thought it was almost arrogant of the disabled organizations to suggest that just because some of their members cope with very disabling illnesses or conditions that everybody should. We don't, in our society, put such an absolute value on life or the sanctity of life. We recognize there are occasions when the taking of a life is not just excused, but it's actually justified. But some people just believe that no one has the right to end a life other than God or the natural process. We are forgetting that there is such a thing as natural death. And we are, um, we are uh, sensationalizing death and we are sensationalizing disability. So that now some people who have a disability situation that others are coping with and finding meaning in their lives despite of, are saying, it's intolerable, I should have the right for the state to endorse that my life is not worth living. And it's that, it's that kind of essentially discrimination against the disabled, that kind of tunnel vision that we are being herded into by the clever propaganda of the pro-euthanasia and pro-assisted suicide movement. No man can claim a richer reward than this, the trembling look of gratitude from one whose suffering has been eased. Well, the current law is a complete and absolute criminal prohibition. So there's a blanket prohibition against assistance or helping someone die, and that's whether or not it's a physician, whether or not the person is suffering, and whether or not it's medical treatment. On its face, it's a very compelling argument that a law that is, prevents people from dying is a good law because it, on its face you think it's going to save lives. What could be a more important law than that? We find out that this law that purports to save lives actually kills people. A person like Gloria, who knows that she is slowly losing the ability to use her body, that if she waited too long, she would no longer be physically capable of taking her own life. She wouldn't be able to uh, open a jar of pills. She wouldn't be able to raise a gun to her head. The only time they can end their life without assistance is when they still want to live. So it's still beneficial life that they still want to live. And they're saying, I'm going to kill myself now because the law won't let anybody assist me later.
I don't have privacy, I don't have any independence, I need help with all activities of daily living like eating, brushing my teeth, going to the bathroom. My greatest fear is to be suffering and not have an end to it. A lot of evidence from people who said, you know, living in the conditions that I'm living in is a fate worse than death. And so I saw through the evidence in this case that there are fates worse than death. If they wait that long to, work to the point where their life is actually worse than death, they're unable to end their life without assistance. Lee and Hollis are a married couple currently living in Roberts Creek, British Columbia. They um, assisted Lee's elderly mother to travel to Switzerland to have an assisted death. Her health was deteriorating fairly quickly. And she said, I'm done. I'd like to move on, and it should be my choice. I look forward to um, ending it all before I become a nothing but an ironing board in a bed. There was a the risk of prosecution. There was a risk of being found out. And... We had to lie to the care facility, which really bothered her a great deal because she couldn't say goodbye. And it bothered us because I don't like to lie. It really is about those people who are suffering, who look for a resolve and, and can't find it. If we could come up with a law that uh, was more humane, that we would all benefit. And this is certainly something that Kate wanted. Well, since the Supreme Court of Canada last heard Sue Rodriguez's plea to change the law, there has been a sea change in social thinking around the world. So when we brought this case forward, we had not only the evidence of Gloria Taylor, but we also had all this evidence from all these other jurisdictions, places like Oregon and Washington and the Netherlands and Belgium. The trial court in the Rodriguez case only heard the voice of Sue Rodriguez, but we had the benefit of the research of social scientists who had studied those systems to see how they were working and if they were working well. The evidence was um, unanimous from the physicians who testified in support of our case and for the physicians who testified in support of Canada's case was that there is some suffering that cannot be alleviated. If these are physical symptoms, we basically have them covered. Sometimes those are covered by palliative sedation, which is completely ethical or sometimes it's called terminal sedation. And what it is is you just sedate the patient to the point of unconsciousness and um, you leave them in that state until they die. There's nothing about um, increasing the um, opiate dose or increasing the sedative dose until the person is asleep. If that's what it takes to control those symptoms, that is ethical. And that's a practice that is practiced in Canada. It's considered medically ethical, and it's totally unregulated, and there's actually not even any universal guidelines um, that tell you how that practice is, is to be used. It's a euphemism because a person can only live without food or water a maximum of two weeks, and, and for many people, not anywhere near that. So if you provide paleo sedation to a person whose life expectancy is more than a week or two weeks or a month, um, then how is that any different than physician-assisted dying? The only difference is, is it may be a method that some physicians prefer because it looks like the patient just fell asleep. But for many, many patients, it's a, a completely unacceptable way of dying. For the families, it's a very difficult way to watch their loved ones literally take days or weeks to die. So, you would reject palliative sedation um, because it would take a few days of your unconsciousness before you died. You just want to have 15 minutes of unconsciousness before you die. Um, are you sure that um, that would be a fair trade for the lives of other people who could, who'd, who could be threatened by this kind of a law? Yeah, one of the typical concerns that is expressed is that it will have a uh, disproportionate impact on what are considered to be socially vulnerable groups, people that who are disabled or perhaps 
the poor. And in fact, the evidence that we gathered, which was both empirical study evidence and anecdotal evidence about people deeply embedded in those systems, was that in fact there is no disproportionate impact. There was no evidence of disproportionate impact across any of the recognized groups. Their concern is that if you legalize physician-assisted dying, a physician may be too quick to suggest or recommend death. First of all, there was no evidence that physicians would react that way. But more to the point, it does a disservice to the disabled person to think that they could be so easily coerced or induced, um, cajoled into choosing death over life um, just because they're disabled. You know, I'm a disabled man and I'm usually on the same side of social and political issues as disabled organizations. But I simply reject the idea being disabled somehow deprives you of the ability to making a free and independent and voluntary decision. It's interesting, at some point, one of the psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Ganzini from Oregon, where the procedure is legal, uh, was telling us about the general personality types of the sort of person who seeks assisted dying. And in general, it's people who have uh, traditionally challenged authority, people who do not like people to make decisions for them, people who are and have always been very strong-minded, strong-willed. And you could see Gloria in everything she was saying, and you could see Rod Sue Rodriguez in everything she was saying. Like, there's, there's no mistaking that they were, in a sense, poster people. The poster cases for assisted suicide are, um, by their, the very nature of the fact they're being used, they're charismatic people. If I believed what they believed, those are exactly the stories I would choose to publicize. We, what we have is a triumph of public relations and, a, an, a, and an abject failure of wisdom. We have to be very, very careful um, about uh, lionizing, idolizing, um, glamorizing uh, suicidal people. We have a worldwide problem with what we call suicide contagion. Copycat suicides are, are recognized to the point that every press council in the world has guidelines on how to report a suicide so as to avoid um, sensationalizing the suicide and raising the suicidal person to the status of a hero, which, which is recognized to be one of the factors that can lead to other people cutting their own lives short. There is no law against suicide. So if I were suffering intolerably and I wanted to end my life as a response to that medical condition, I'm completely entitled to. But if I am wanting to commit the same act for the same reason, with the same knowledge and intention, but I need, because I'm disabled, somebody to help me, I'm not allowed to get it. That's an unfair burden. No one is allowed to have assistance, but the burden is unfair on those who actually need it because of a disability. And I, I don't think that the risk of a floodgates is real enough to impose that burden on that group of people. How does it make sense that if I'm able-bodied, I can kill myself in any way I want to? And if I'm not able-bodied, that I can't do anything? Well, suicide, of course, like many other bad things, is not illegal and yet is not desirable. We've simply recognized that the law is, is a bad instrument in the sense that making suicide illegal is, is, is uh, missing the point. Because the, the fact of the matter is that a disabled person doesn't need to commit suicide either. It's because we look with horror on the lives of the disabled that we would suggest that there may be some of them that have a need to commit suicide. You know, the issue that somehow this d diminishes the value of life w with a disability, I disagree with. 
Like I had my whole life ahead of me at 23 and I was good to go to fight. If I was 93 or if I it was in a situation where I, I wasn't going to get better, it was just going to get worse and worse. I think it's an empowerment for people with disabilities. It will bring peace of mind to a lot of people, including myself, uh, that uh, I'm not going to end up in a hopeless situation for years on end. So we're throwing a bunch of guidelines into a medical system which already can make big mistakes in prognosis and diagnosis and we're waving off the potential wrongful death as just the cost of doing business. Right. Um, well, the evidence was that misdiagnosis is, um, is very rare. It's quite rare. Errors in um, assessing prognosis are more common. Um, but even, even assuming that you could have a misdiagnosis, because of course nobody's infallible, um, the same risks exist for all other end-of-life care that's currently legal and available in Canada. I think what we do in society is we balance risks and we can't be paralyzed by risk, especially not in the medical system. All medical procedures have risk and we live with that. That's part of a society in which we've decided that we're going to give patients autonomy. We don't go around telling people that they cannot decide not to have chemotherapy. We let them decide for themselves. We don't go around telling people that they must have operations. We let them decide them for themselves. There's no reason you would take this particular medical procedure and say it has a zero tolerance risk as a medical risk. It's interesting that Canadians would have seen the problem with capital punishment, where all the scrutiny of a capital murder trial and all the hours of testimony from conflicting witnesses are brought to bear and a mistake still could be made and there could be a wrongful death. And yet, um, people are suggesting that just a set of guidelines tossed into the medical system and allowed to rattle around in there um, are going to somehow not create wrongful death it just it defies it defies belief well it's very distinguishable from capital punishment in fact it's the opposite in terms of principles from capital punishment capital punishment is about the involuntary taking of life from people who wish to maintain it and it's the fact that it's being taken from them by the state against their will that makes it particularly contemptible this is the exact opposite this is people with autonomy saying, I wish to end my life now, and I wish to end it because of suffering. What happened? Well, in this case, there was a, there was a lockup. The judgment came down, and, and we went to court, and we were sort of in this room down in the basement of the court. It's offered to all sides and interveners, and I think the only people who agreed to go to the courthouse were Joe and Allison and Grace and I. What uh, Madam Justice Smith did is she struck down the laws that criminalize physician-assisted dying, and she found that there were violations of Section 7, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and that the laws also violated the Section 15 equality rights. One of the things, and I'll always remember this about Madam Justice Smith, and if I ever become a judge, I will always remember it, because in lots of decisions, you have to get to the end to find out what the answer is, and she put it in the first paragraph. Maria? Yeah? Joe Helen Grace and Allison and Sheila. Hi. How are you? I am nervous <laughs> and excited. And tell me the good news. Would you like to know what the court says? Yeah, I do. I do. Oh, All God. right. Oh, All God. right. Oh. oh, thank you, God. Thank you. We were elated. We were beyond elated. We won on every single point. It had been such a tough fight. Madam Justice Smith's decision, I don't know if I can say it's unprecedented in its length, but it is. Uh, 
extremely thorough, extremely thoughtful, covered all of the evidence, covered all of the arguments. Um, it, it's a decision which demands the highest respect of the government of Canada. We hoped that at that point that Canada would sort of see the light and read the judgment. It was so carefully reasoned and say, hey, we've got a problem here and, and maybe we're going we're gonna to take this judgment and fix this law. Um, but they, they didn't and they appealed and so we knew we had to carry on with the fight moving forward. The BC Court of Appeal handed down a decision today on a landmark right to die case. BC's Court of Appeal has upheld Canada's ban on doctor-assisted suicide in a 2-1 split decision. So the BC Court of Appeal basically said its hands were tied and that the issue, if it was going to be revisited, would have to be revisited by the Supreme Court of Canada. Much of our team from, from BCCLA has come from British Columbia out here to Ottawa. Well, Grace Pastine, who's our litigation director, is here. She has been um, shepherding this case from the very beginning, along with the, the pro bono counsel working for us. Uh, of course, uh, Lee Carter and, and Hollis Johnson are here, um, who are plaintiffs in the case, uh, and a number of members of their family. The reason why we have so many staff here, we're the ones who've brought this case forward along with the families. So we do feel we have um, a special obligation. It's important uh, to be able to communicate both with Canadians broadly through the media and also to our supporters uh, about what this means. Um, it was incredible to go to the Supreme Court. I have so much regard for the justices on that court. And this was such a special case to bring there with this legal team. This is a momentous occasion. You would get nervous anyway, frankly, because it's a big enough stage. But then if you add on all the responsibility of it and the idea that if you did it wrong, that people might be out there suffering because you did it wrong. And by the time you've layered all the things you've taken on, by the time you go to stand up, it's a very intimidating thing. We just get over in a well, our adversary in this case is the federal government. There were three lawyers working on this case for us who were working completely pro bono, whereas the federal government has virtually unlimited resources at hand. So it was really a battle of David and Goliath proportions. Now let me finally cut to the chase, to the heart of this appeal. The most vociferous opposition to our challenge comes from some church groups and some disabled organizations. To the disabled organizations, I say this. I would be the very last person to ever suggest that one is, quote, better off dead, quote, than being disabled. It was incredible. They were obviously so well prepared and so ready for it. Um, so I, I, it felt like a good hearing. Obviously, it's impossible to know how it will come out, but I felt like we were heard and I felt like they understood the arguments. The judicial process is somewhat like a, like a pyramid where you start at the bottom and it, the trial's long and arduous and lots of evidence and, and the Court of Appeal starts to narrow the issue and we get to the pinnacle of the pyramid, Supreme Court of Canada, and the issues are really very, uh, really very narrow. The trial judge has made findings of fact based on almost 15,000 pages of evidence. And by the time we get here, 
the Supreme Court of Canada has to be very deferential to those findings of fact. Those are the findings you move forward with, and so it's it's all important that the trial judge be as engaged as they can be. In this case, we definitely had that, and we had a really careful trial judgment. So it was it was everything. You know, most trial decisions are final. That is, most trial judges, when they're at work, uh, operate under the assumption that they're going to have the last word because that's what happens. Most cases are not appealed, and most cases that are appealed aren't overturned. So there's a strong incentive to try to get things right the first time. Every case is important to the parties, and particularly so if it's going to be the last word. Lynn Smith is retired now, I understand, but but uh, I think we're, we're dealing with individuals who have caught the zeitgeist, you know, they, they, they want what they want. And so, um, instead of being a judge, instead of, uh, of being nine judges, um, we have people who are putting their finger up to the wind of opinion polls and, uh, and deciding that, that um, they can usurp the role of parliament. I don't know if a bunch of media coverage, per se, makes that much difference. The fact that people have changed their opinion makes a big difference. So when the media coverage is about the fact that people who used to oppose it have changed their opinion, then that's a really big deal. Or when you get a poll that says the Canadian public feels this way, that's a really big deal. Now, is that a really big deal to the bench in terms of what actually goes into their decision? I, I doubt it. Those are overarching facts to them, and they try very hard about keeping their mind to the record. Um, judges, I, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that uh, I, when I was a judge, and the judges I know do read the newspapers and watch television, but uh, I think that everyone is very aware of the need to decide cases on the basis of the evidence in the courtroom. Again, I'll refer to what judges tell juries because it applies to judges as fact finders as well. Judges tell juries, now don't go out and start investigating the case. <laughs> don't Google the accused. Don't drive to the scene of the motor vehicle accident and see if you think you would have seen the car coming. You don't do that and judges uh, don't do that either. You, um, it's, it's within the four corners of the courtroom, the evidence that's placed before you, that you have to decide the case. It will be one of the most significant decisions in the Supreme Court's history. Tomorrow, it will decide whether Canadians should have the constitutional right to control the way they die. It's a, a snowy Thursday evening, and we're anticipating the Supreme Court of Canada's decision, which is going to be handed down tomorrow morning. I know that uh... Our lawyers who argued the case, who've poured so much of their hearts, their time, their thinking, their emotions, their preoccupation for years been poured into this. So I'm very grateful to the BC Civil Liberties and to the lawyers and all the other people who have come forward to support this case. And that just doesn't mean it's not just us guys, but it's a lot of other people that have spoken. And you know what I think, Lee? There is all of that different question of what could happen next, what does that landscape look like? And the more that you talk to people about how important it is and why you did it, that will have a real impact because it is the narrative around the issue. They can't change the policy issues, they can just strike down the law. And then the rest of it has to be a public conversation, a political conversation. Right now, it is very overwhelming for me to think about all of those contributions to this case. And um, I feel a, a real responsibility. It was a pretty late night, so. I'm pretty nervous. It's, it's, it's very strange this morning. All of the work in the last four years just comes down to flipping the page to the page that says whether or not we won or lost. We're anxious. Uh, I'm anxious. I'm nervous. 
and um, I, I've always thought that, well, I, I guess I've always thought we were gonna win this case, but I, I just don't know if we will. We got everything. Wow. Good morning. We won unanimously. <laughs> we won on everything. The full, full victory. Signed by every member of the court. And, and if Elaine is there, uh, congratulations to you, Elaine, for all of the, the work that you've put in on this case. We're all thinking of you here. You do your stuff here. Yeah. I read the whole Thank you. Now we've got to get some press releases out. So I'm going to get off the phone, but uh, so we'll talk soon, I'm sure. we'd win. But I didn't think I'd cry. <laughs> so I haven't. This is a tremendous victory for human rights and for compassion at the end of life. What this decision means is that Canadians who are suffering unbearably at the end of life will have a choice now. A huge victory for Canadians and a legacy for Kay. Thank you. Thank you. All the messages, actually, that's what I was looking at on my phone. All the messages started coming in and people saying, you know, I just, yeah, I just saw it on the news. And, you know, my mom's name will be in, in the history books now. This is hugely meaningful for the BC Civil Liberties Association. This is uh, really the largest fight that we've done in our in our 52 53 year history you know when i started off this case i saw a small article in the sun and at that time it was hardly it was just a small box article or something like that and today, wherever you look, it's in every magazine across the country. So my quality of life, and I think other people's quality of life, have improved because there is no longer existential threat of being in misery for indefinite amounts of time. One of my favorite poets uh, wrote, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. I don't think physician assisted dying should be anything other than a last resort measure for anybody. But I think that it's wrong for the disabled organization to sort of put all disabled people in sort of one basket, that they are somehow incapable of making a free and independent choice. When the first young Canadian dies a needless suicide death because of suicide contagion from the glamorization of assisted suicide as a way to, to deal with a disability or an illness, then I, I can't help but ask the question, was it all worth it? Well, um, I think at the heart of this case, there's sort of two principles, and it's autonomy on the one hand, and it's kind of mercy on the other. What I think this case is about is people's ability to make sort of fundamentally important personal choices about health care at the end of life or in circumstances where they're 
they're suffering intolerably and maybe they're not at the end of their life. So it's about affording the dignity of choice to these people and as a society, I think that's a merciful thing to do. I think it's fundamentally incompatible with life to tell someone they have to live it. I think it's fundamentally incompatible with what we should understand to be life for one of the qualities of that life to be involuntary and that you can't capture people in life and you can't force people to live and it's certainly not the government's job. Do I like doing this? I love doing this. I've never done anything more worthwhile and I doubt I ever will.